Good morning to all of you. Thank you for coming to this week's Clinical Pathological Conference. My name is Dr. Angzeb and uh, I'm consultant cardiologist and the topic for today's presentation is peripartum cardiomyopathy, its management, five things to know. Um, so let's begin our lecture. Before moving on to the main topic, uh, let's quickly talk about some of the basics about peripartum cardiomyopathy and cardiovascular diseases affecting females uh, during their pregnancy. Uh, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of maternal mortality and accounts for 25 to 30 percent of all maternal deaths. One half to two thirds, that is 50 to 66 percent of maternal uh, cardiovascular death is due to cardiomyopathy. And there are certain maternal risk factors that are associated with increased risk of adverse outcomes. And some of these include patients from the African-American descent. And also, uh, if any patient that is uh, 34 years or older, that is advanced maternal age, uh, if uh, there is multiple gestation and pregnancies, patients suffering from Preeclampsia are at increased risk for these uh, adverse events and also hypertensive diabetics and patients who are obese. And uh, we know that normal pregnancy uh, can sometimes uh, present with the signs and symptoms that uh, can be confused with those of peripartum cardiomyopathy. Examples include breathing difficulty, dyspnea on exertion, uh, orthopnea, and pedal edema. So one should be quite vigilant while uh, clinically assessing these patients. And we uh, exactly don't know about the mechanism of uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy. But an imbalance in placental hormones leading to microvascular dysfunction and often uh, hypertensive pregnancy disorders may be inferred from the current data. <clears throat> uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy include preeclampsia uh, that is present in uh, 22 to 29.3 percent of the patients who have peripartum cardiomyopathy and other hypertensive disorders may be present in up to 37% of the patients. This condition may have an incompletely penetrant, uh, penetrant genetic origin, that is the condition doesn't occur in all gene carriers, or is the result of a double hit phenomena of genetic predisposition plus disease provoking risk factors, right? So the interaction of genetic and environmental factors can also play a role in the occurrence of this disease. Moving on to the diagnostic criteria for peripartum cardiomyopathy, the Heart Failure Association of the European Society of Cardiology Working Group defines peripartum cardiomyopathy as an idiopathic cardiomyopathy presenting with heart failure, secondary to left ventricular systolic dysfunction with a cutoff value for ejection fraction of less than 45% towards the end of pregnancy or in the months following delivery where no other cause of heart failure is found. Classically, we remember from what we learned in our medical schools that peripartum cardiomyopathy develops in the last month of gestation until five months postpartum. The reported incidence of peripartum cardiomyopathy ranges from 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 4,000 births, with greater than 40% of cases occurring in African American women. Signs of pulmonary congestion should prompt rapid assessment of left ventricular function to accurately diagnose peripartum cardiomyopathy. This is an algorithm. I have adopted it from the guidelines. Uh, 
so let's go through it and we can see that any patient who have signs or symptoms of heart failure that is elevated BNP edema or orthopnea should proceed with a chest radiography and if there is pulmonary congestion echocardiography with left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45 percent so these patients this is usually generally the general scheme of approaching uh, these patients so any patient who presents to your clinical practice who have signed who are pregnant and who have signs and symptoms of heart failure who have a raised bnp on clinical assessment there is edema on history there is orthopnea and a chest radiograph suggesting pulmonary congestion go for echocardiography and if the ejection fraction is less than 45 percent this means that the patient can be uh, suffering from peripartum cardiomyopathy and the rate limiting step in the diagnosis of peripartum cardiomyopathy is recognizing the signs and symptoms of heart failure on physical examination and imaging studies for example radiography and echocardiography also elevated b type nitroretic peptide levels and pulmonary edema are the more specific clinical and lab features the diagnosis of peripartum cardiomyopathy should only be made in the setting of reduced left ventricular ejection fraction if the ejection fraction is greater than 45 percent look for other causes beware of preeclampsia many of the features of peripartum cardiomyopathy and preeclampsia can overlap uh, so 90 percent of the cases with preeclampsia do not develop peripartum cardiomyopathy and 50 percent of the patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy has no history of preeclampsia it means that only 10 percent of the patients with preeclampsia can go on to develop peripartum cardiomyopathy on the other hand 50% of the patient with peripartum cardiomyopathy may not, uh, may not display any history of preeclampsia. The key point is early recognition and treatment of signs and symptoms of heart failure that can help prevent peripartum cardiomyopathy associated death. Right, coming to uh, the management and treatment most of the times peripartum cardiomyopathy is treated just like other cardiomyopathies the four cardinal steps in the management of patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy are management of their heart failure anticoagulation and also the use of new and emerging agents and sudden cardiac death prevention so we will briefly go one by one the and we'll talk about the medical management of heart failure the role of anticoagulants and the role of new and emerging agents and what is the role of sudden cardiac death prevention in these patients right so how are we going to manage heart failure in these patients Standard heart failure therapies have not been studied extensively in pregnant and lactating patients. So this is the uh, most important hurdle in properly treating these patients. And the standard of care for management of peripartum cardiomyopathy treatment for heart failure includes beta blockers. Uh, and we all know that not all beta blockers are safe during pregnancy. We can use metoprolol loop diuretics because other class of diuretics especially the potassium sparing diuretics and the aldosterone receptor antagonists are not recommended in most patients hydrolyzine nitrates combination because we can't give these patients ac inhibitors irbs and arnis and digoxin so these patients should be given beta blockers metoprolol almost likely they should receive loop diuretics for symptomatic improvement of their congestion and a combination of hydrolyzine and nitrates to improve their mortality and morbidity because these patients can't take ac inhibitors arbs and arnis and also digoxin can be given to these patients 
In the postpartum period, however, enalapril and captopril along with spironolactone are compatible with breastfeeding. So we can then switch on to a more standard therapies once the baby is delivered and the mother is in her postpartum period uh, and the baby is being bre breastfed. Is there any role for anticoagulation in these patients? Well, uh, let's, about, uh, let's talk about some of the risk factors because these patients are at increased risk of thromboembolism for certain reasons and these are the hypercoagulable states of pregnancy and the venous stasis from low cardiac output. So the incidence of left ventricular thrombus on initial echocardiogram is 10 to 17 percent in these patients. Anticoagulation can be considered in patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy when the left ventricular ejection fraction is uh, severely impaired that is less than 30 percent. Both warfarin as well as low molecular weight heparin with monitoring of NT10A levels. Both can be given during breastfeeding. However, while the patient is on anticoagulation, avoid estrogen containing oral contraceptive pills because they are uh, associated with the hypercoagulable state and can uh, potentially result in uh, adverse clinical outcomes. For example, uh, propagation of the uh, clot and uh, development of deep wind thrombosis and embolism, uh, thromboembolic phenomena. The emerging and new agents, we know that bromocreptin, it is one of the prolactin inhibitors, is associated with greater LV recovery at six months. And there is high left ventricular improvement rates compared to standard treatment. The European Society of Cardiology gives bromocreptin a class 2b level of evidence B recommendation uh, because uh, the data from this, uh, the studies that have shown the benefits of bromocreptin are basically small studies and uh, 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 have not represented the an accurate uh, sample or uh, a baseline population characteristics cannot be generalized to most of the patients. Uh, so this drug still is experimental in most uh, settings except for the European Society of Cardiology recommendations. And the other uh, thing that should be remembered is that if bromocreptin is advised to a patient because it is associated with the uh, thromboembolic phenomena, so such patients should receive systemic anticoagulants. Breastfeeding in general can be continued safely in patients with persistent left ventricular dysfunction. There is a myth that um, lactating mothers with reduced left ventricular ejection fraction are vulnerable for deteriorating in their left ventricular uh, systolic function. However, current studies have questioned this approach and now in most cases breastfeeding can be recommended uh, to the mother, uh, allowing the mothers to breastfeed their children. And finally, in the management uh, section, few points about sudden cardiac death prevention. These patients are at risk of ventricular tachycardia and ventricular tachycardia uh, is present in about 4.2 percent of these patients. 2.2 percent of these patients can, um, can go into cardiac arrest and 1 percent into ventricular fibrillation. Variable cardiovascular defibrillators may be considered in patients with left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 35%. Uh, when to implant an ICD in a patient with PPCM is unclear. After discussing the management of these patients, a question arises that whether a left ventricular ejection fraction recovers in these patients or not. So left ventricular ejection fraction recovers in most patients within six months but the outcomes depends on the level of uh, care the patient receives.
50 to 80 percent of women with peripartum cardiomyopathy will recover left ventricular ejection fraction to more than 50 percent within six months postpartum. Mortality rate ranges in different studies from 11 to 16 percent. Unfortunately, black patients are affected more than white patients and tend to have more reduced left ventricular ejection fraction and reduced left ventricular ejection fraction recovery at one year. And they do have high mortality rates of 24% at seven years. Here I am going to discuss with you people uh, what are the future pregnancy risks uh, in these patients. So the future pregnancy risks are dependent on left ventricular ejection fraction recovery. The 2018 European Society of Cardiology guidelines discourage subsequent pregnancy in patients with a history of peripartum cardiomyopathy without recovered left ventricular function. Any patient with an uh, impaired LV systolic function should not consider pregnancy. Subsequent pregnancies in patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy and reduced left ventricular ejection fraction will result in acute heart failure in about 50% and there is a 50% chance of worsening cardiomyopathy even 25 to 50% of the patient can die as demonstrated by one study and patients with recovered left ventricular function uh, there is a 20% of uh, there is a chance of re reduction in left ventricular systolic function in 20% of the patients. Rates of abortion and preterm delivery are more common in pregnant women with persistent left ventricular dysfunction. So the uh, point to be noted here is that the future pregnancy risk should be individualized depending most importantly on the level of the left ventricular ejection fraction recovery. All those patients who have not recovered, uh, who still have that impaired left ventricular systolic function should avoid being getting pregnant because there, is a, there are chances of acute heart failure, worsening cardiomyopathy and even death uh, with a high rate of 25 to 50%. Even patients with a recovered left ventricular ejection fraction, uh, some 20% of them can uh, have impaired left ventricular systolic function and recurrence of cardiomyopathy in their subsequent pregnancies. So what patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy should do? Management of these patients should involve a multidisciplinary team who can provide input on both maternal and fetal health risks. And these cardio obstetric teams provide accessible prenatal, perinatal, and postpartum care, which is critical to early detection of potentially preventable morbidity and mortality. All patients with a history of peripartum cardiomyopathy who are considering future pregnancies should undergo thorough counseling, education, and if are pregnant, should be monitored carefully. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please do ask me and this video will be uploaded to my channel as well. So I would like you to please subscribe to that channel. Thank you very much for attending. Stay tuned for future videos. Thank you.